Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about infrastructure and in particular a project which is a team project with Halcro, the engineers, and Volterra. I start with this image by a Dutch photographer, Ellen Cui. And for me, this is what infrastructure is about. It's about a confidence in the future. It's about an awareness of the needs to come. And it's an investment in future generations. And if we need any reminders of that, then all the benefits, the quality of life that we enjoy today in so many respects, we're indebted to those, mostly in the 19th century, who took the initiatives that they took on our behalf. And if we don't do anything for future generations, then that's fine as long as we're precise and that's a decision and we don't just stumble along pretending that the future doesn't matter. I start really with one aspect of infrastructure which is public space and which has a cultural dimension. Whether that public space is a metro system, whether it's a bridge, a public square, a route. This is Rodin's sculpture. And what is interesting is that nobody knows who it belongs to. It doesn't have an owner. And that lies across from government, the seat of government. It's a very important work of art. Rather like in Victoria Gardens, on the opposite side, this extraordinary Henry Moore, which also doesn't belong to anybody. It was gifted to the nation in 1967 by Henry Moore. It became the subject of some changes of ministries, of agencies, and since 2001, everybody has denied knowledge of it. In one way or another, they all say, it's not ours. And it's not ours because it's desperately in need of maintenance. And nobody really wants to take responsibility for it. And that cultural dimension, as I'll try to weave through historically, is a very important dimension in our lives, whether we're aware of it or not. Appearances matter. I believe that passionately. These are the people to whom it doesn't belong. <laughs> and in a way, it magnifies some of the problems of the environment at the macro scale because this is one aspect of it at the micro scale. And <clears throat> the appearance of that building, of that sculpture, has been transformed by changes to the infrastructure resulting from security and in a way the appearance there is interestingly as I'll try to demonstrate there is really no focus on responsibility for the appearance for that dimension whether you call it the civic dimension or whether you call it the beauty uh, the poetry uh, whatever it is that transforms the utilitarian and that's interesting because there's a very strong national tradition of the civic dimension related to heroic works of infrastructure, investments in future generations still to come for needs which are not known at the time. What are the problems that we suffer as a nation at the moment? We have fantastic ports, but it's very difficult to move the goods which arrive and depart in the body of the physical infrastructure of the nation. The roads are blocked, congested, reaching saturation point. The railway, the transportation systems are creaking, they're at saturation. We have known uh, infrastructure to come. We have generations of power stations which are running down, early generations of nuclear which have a finite, very, very short life. 
we have a thousand pylons, 300 miles, 500 kilometers of transmission wires to race across the country. These are known. We also have the needs to bring broadband access to level, to equalize the poorer north with higher unemployment, which is running at nearly twice the unemployment rate in the south. We have a desperate impinging housing shortage in the southeast. And we have an airport which was once a vital hub and is now being overtaken and running to the end of its life as a hub. It has a vital role to continue to play in terms of the potential to transform to another hub. But it's reached a point where really the Band-Aid solutions are ceasing to work. If we look at Heathrow, it's one of the very, very few airports in the world which is overflown by its final approach over a city of some five million people in terms of noise and pollution and more than anything else of risk. It's interesting to compare the number of people who are exposed to risk and noise compared with other European hubs. Hubs which are emerging and which have the potential to grow as hubs, whilst Heathrow wanes as a hub and in many respects has already been overtaken. And statistically you could argue that Heathrow in that sense and the London over which the aircraft overfly is a statistic waiting to happen. I mean, this was the write-off of BA Flight 38 from Beijing on the final approach as it approached the threshold of 27 left. Uh, ice particles in the fuel at the end of the journey from Beijing clogged and, and at that point there was no power. Now, if that had happened one minute earlier, then it defies the imagination, the carnage that would have resulted from it. So it's not just noise and pollution, it's risk. In one sense, my wife said nobody will understand what Humpty Dumpty is because many people... <laughs> so <clears throat> whether I say Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And in one sense, the fragmentation, the various elements, they... You know, how, what is the challenge? How do we bring them together in a holistic, confident, ambitious, optimistic view of the future? Well, who is responsible for the infrastructure, for the environment? In a way, it's divided, that's not unusual. It's shared between different departments, ministerial departments, and then of course there are the non-cabinet departments and surrounding it are those executive agencies. So it's diffuse. Now, there is hope in the sense that the Treasury has been given the initiative to coordinate infrastructure, and in that sense have prepared a National Infrastructure Plan for 2010. 2011 is waiting. But there is one missing significant omission from that report, and it's aviation. So does a body like this, which is advisory, how, in terms of making long-term decisions, how does it have teeth? I think that, really, this exploration is in the spirit of adding to that debate. Why would I then move to the image of a car? Because, in a way, the great engineers of the past, who've been innovators, have also been consistently concerned with the civic dimension, with the beauty of the lines. In this case, this is a car which did many things which had not happened to production cars before. I could be showing a different car with different engineers, or I could be talking about somebody like Steve Jobs. Why is the phone, this phone, so appealing? Is it just because it brings together in one handheld device so many different functions which had been the subject of separate elements. Yes, that's part of the answer. But also, it is the aesthetic dimension. It is a very beautiful, high-end high product. And it has an incredible universal appeal. And that is because of its aesthetic dimension. That's a personal view, of course. I don't think it's any accident that Steve's father was a passionate classic car restorer and was concerned about the things under the hood, 
the bonnet, if you like, uh, that you didn't see but were significantly important. And you can take this device apart and there is as much loving care in terms of the things that you can't see. So that aesthetic thing permeates it. And I believe it permeates in, in all kinds of ways that we're not consciously aware of. I mean, food, for example. Carrots. There are many varieties of carrots. But did you know that carrots go through a beauty parade? That this machine will decide which carrots are right for us and which carrots automatically go into animal livestock. For example, the one on the left has survived the beauty test. <laughs> the one on the right has been rejected. So in the supermarket, do you think they realize that these carrots, each one has been photographed 40 times, 360 degrees, to decide whether it's the right size, the right shape, the right color, the right texture? That's the tip of the iceberg. The carrots in the corner, everything in that basket has gone through an aesthetic test, a beauty test. And there's another story which weaves into this. Because for every three baskets of food worldwide, the UK is 33% is wasted. In India, it's 40%. In Singapore, it's 20%. Um, I think it's something like 1.3 billion tonnes a year thrown away. And it costs a billion dollars a year to dispose of the food waste, apart from any other waste in the United States. Of course, there's some, a silver lining to this story because in terms of infrastructure, the potential to create plants Obviously, there's a moral imperative in terms of reducing waste instead of just increasing agricultural production. Um, but the processing of waste to energy, this is one example. There are many, many examples. This one is in the Netherlands. And this processes 300,000 tonnes of waste, services 70,000 house households. So this, at a community citywide scale, offers great, uh, great potential, which leads me seamlessly to somebody else who managed to process waste at an epic scale. This guy, Joseph Bazalgette, um, the middle of the 19th century, and an extraordinary response to a cholera epidemic, so driven by what was called the Great Stink at the time. But again, returning to my, my theme, this not only through the integration of a sewer system, which is already creaking and now well, way, way beyond its shelf life, um, but at the time, and still serving us, incorporated what is now the district and circle line on the left below there, uh, transportation below ground, the sewerage system, incredible light fittings, planting trees, the civic dimension inextricably woven into the utilitarian response to the problems. George Stevenson, these are inspirations from the past. It's a longer list. I've edited this out quite ruthlessly. But a reminder of the way in which in the past we created infrastructure and the pace at which we did it in 20 years to go from 100 kilometers to 11,500. And what is interesting is this became embedded in our culture, whether this was rain, steam and speed, Turner, 1844, um, or whether it was the heroic works which later beautified the, lands the landscape, because in a way it owed a lot to another tradition, the landscape tradition, which I'll come to. This is popular wallpaper, the time of the great, um, of Crystal Palace, of the Great Exhibition in 1851, and again celebrates in a different kind of way, but at very much at a popular culture, that confidence and, 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 and that belief in the future. I think it's extraordinary that the gauge on the right, which, which, which um, makes this train possible, would still function with Stevenson's rocket. It is the same gauge. Brunel lost out, but that's another story. The only two countries which didn't adopt Stevenson's gauge were Russia and Spain. And it's interesting that Spain has come back to Stevenson's gauge for their high-speed train. And that's true of high-speed trains. And again, 
the romance of this, these are uh, Tokyo's bullet trains, and anybody who's experienced that firsthand is just a great civilizing experience. Another hero, this guy uh, Barlow, in that tradition of the great engineer, St Pancras Station of 1868. And if you look at the construction shot of this, it's interesting that that undercroft, which was carrying very, very lightweight trains above, um, a bit like the curves of Stevenson's railway gauges. You saw the great sweeping curves. So these anticipated a future beyond in the same way that this guy Bazalgette sized the sewers times two for twice the population of London. So they were looking far, far ahead. They were not just concentrating on the short-term issues of the day, like the opening thing of, of, of the girl. It was about a, an optimism about future generations. And that beer cellar under there is now the site of the high-speed train, and indeed the station above is the link uh, to Europe. And questions about whether this now permeates the nation or whether it just stops uh, at this station. We'll talk about that connectivity later. The other tradition that I like to weave into this, because I, I feel in a way it is very much a part of the national heritage, and <clears throat> we may have been inspired at the time of the 18th century by the 17th century French painters who created the idealized landscape, but some of the inventions of, I mean, one device called a ha-ha, here the landowner will look to the horizon as if he owned the entire place, whereas his boundary is where that red line is. But that's a very, very subtle demarcation line, because when you look at it very, very closely, it really is quite clever. It gives you the illusion that the landscape goes on forever. And it's that cross-section there, it's that kind of cutting. And as you'll see, that is also inspirational in terms of one of the initiatives that we propose for the infrastructure spine. So if you look at the United Kingdom in terms of its green belts, currently under threat, I don't think we realize how fortunate we are to have those green buffers around our cities. And you only have to look at continental Europe to see the opposite effect when you don't have that protection. And I know that those are threatened in the cause of economic regeneration, but I don't believe that that is the clue to economic generation. I think it runs far deeper and it's much more strategic. Um, and here, if we look at the potential for connectivity by bringing together things which are normally quite separate, whether that's power, communication, rail, bicycle trails, hiking trails, then these are essentially green fingers in the landscape tradition. So they should enhance the countryside rather than, uh, rather than bespoiling it. This is another way of looking at that infrastructure which would be a spine and which would even out and bring greater opportunities and, and, and equalize uh, prosperity through, through the nation. If I took a very, very simple uh, image here and said that what happens if you if you depress the train, if you depress it down into the landscape, you dig a trench and with the soil that you remove, you create banks either side of it and you, instead of burying these power transmission lines, you actually cover them with the spoil. So, and you combine that with a hiking trail. So this is a very, very small scale example with a small scale train. Essentially, it disappears in the landscape. If you look at this writ larger and you start to say we need high-speed connectivity, that will take a lot of pressure off the local network. We add to the local network and we add a freight element. So we have four railway tracks. We bring power communication, broadband, water, we combine it with cycling trails and it's a landscape initiative. And so we look at that at a larger scale Considered in isolation, if you don't go this approach, then when you have any kind of new train, whether it's high-speed train or whatever, you have a lot of structures, a lot of gantries holding wires in the sky. And then when you take those thousand pylons and the 300 miles of transmission, you have a lot of, um, you have an other impact on the landscape. But what happens if you bring those together in this initiative and you create this depression and at this particular point, you make all the transitions across that much easier. 
a bridge becomes a part of the landscape, less of an imposition. Um, and so you could combine this with green routes, with cycle routes. So it has, it, it has this, um, this landscaping, the equivalent of the civic dimension. It gives something back. In especially sensitive areas, it would be totally tunneled. It would be a series of tunnels below the ground. So there are a mixture of modes as this moves um, uh, north-south uh, uh, across the country. And then to really liberate the potential for, um, for the United Kingdom as a freight uh, centre to take advantage of shipping trades and to take away some of the pressure for containers, something like 80% of containers are transported by road, uh, only 20% by, by, by rail. If we looked at the way in which you could siphon off some of that 80% and put it into this spine, then you would be equalizing 50-50. So you take a lot of pressure off the road system, give it greater capacity and resist the short-term urge to add more and more and more roads because they'd just be better utilised, it would be a better, a better balance. This is showing the importance of bypassing London. There's a paradox here. To do London a great favour, you need to avoid it. And by avoiding it, you also speed up the movement north to south. So of this larger initiative, Part of the, of the funding would be for a significant orbital which would bypass London. That's looking at the story in terms of the United Kingdom. If we looked at the story in terms of Europe, then here we see the potential for the sea, um, the sea routes to eventually come and again orbitally bypass London. So you have the potential now combined with the, with the airport, for it start to be a hub for Europe. So it would, it would be able to filter southwards as well as, as well as northwards. And then there's something else that needs to happen and has a certain inevitability, and that is an extension and a replacement for the existing Thames barrier, which is now, I mean, since 1984, already uh, historic. So if you create a Thames barrier, which is an integral part of the overall concept related to a Thames hub airport and crossing below the surface and a tidal energy farm, you then create also the estuary development areas that will satisfy uh, the, the housing needs in, in the southeast. So there are many parallel benefits from this holistic approach. Here we see a visualisation of, uh, of the flood barrier and the way in which that also works with, the, um, with, with, with developing tidal energy. That would provide free energy to be able to drive the airport in its entirety or a significant number of, of, of homes. And just recapping below the surface there, you can see that that is... When you combine the Thames barrier the tidal energy powerhouse and the, and the tunnel, there are obvious economies in terms of bringing these otherwise separate entities together. And you can see the relationship here between the proposed airport and the, um, and the Thames barrier on, on the right-hand side there. If we look at the projected UK passenger demand going up to 2030, it is ever increasing. And to put that in context around the European competitors, and we speak with some authority on this because we were responsible for the master plan for Frankfurt. And if you look at the unused capacity and you put that relative, you see that really Heathrow, how do we, having already fallen behind, having no potential for expansion, how do we catch up? In one sense, all the disadvantages are actually advantages to us because what we can do with this initiative is we can leapfrog and, and, and we, can, we can really take advantage of the fact that we are not in a, in a location which is constrained. Um, and if we look at Heathrow, 
Heathrow has been a vital hub, has a critical role to play in terms of the transfer of power from one hub uh, to another. And at the moment, it is serving very well those major current economies. But as the world changes, as the emphasis shifts inevitably from those established European uh, northern markets, and you start to look at the emerging markets, there are no direct flights from Heathrow to any of these destinations. They all have direct flights from European hubs. And we speak with some personal experience of this because if we go to Latin America, we have to move through Madrid as an office to get there. So it, it's, it affects everybody. There are some weekly flights from Heathrow, but unlike those European competitors, not daily flights. And the potential of going eastwards to the estuary as an airport, there are no flights over London and all the approaches are over water. And um, there are upsides and downsides to any initiative. Um, the downsides through not doing anything at all is this particular projection here, the sources at the bottom, and the projection in terms of 2050 and the way that the world will shift. And certainly, the relation to any of those countries, certainly in terms of Brazil, if, if anybody has the experience we have of engaging with emerging economies like this, it is absolutely awesome. I mean, this is a city, official figures 90 million, depending on how you interpret it, maybe 27 million, um, a high rise economy, as far as the eye can see, incredible dynamic, incredible energy, great style. I mean incredible diversity of, of opportunities, great areas of deprivation, areas of favelas, but, um, but making a mark. And certainly that, whether it's this, whether it's China or whatever, in all kinds of ways is very much about the future. If we compare the number of people exposed to risk and noise, there's a direct co-relationship. When, when the aircraft gets so low that it's really blasting your ears, it's then so low if the power fails, it's not going to glide anywhere. It's not going to fly anywhere. And there's only one place it can go. And you can compare that with the Thames hub. It's dramatic. It's dramatic even in comparison with these European competitors. If we look a little more closely at, uh, at the location in question, it is a mixture of rural, it's a mixture of urban, and very, very much looming in the background is always the industrial complex. It is, in terms of density, one of the least dense areas in the United Kingdom. It is also an area of high deprivation, as these two charts show here. Undoubtedly, building an airport there would have an element of disruption, upheaval. Um, that would need generosity, it would need compassion, sensitivity, it would need addressing the cultural heritage of that area. There are listed buildings, there are 12 listed buildings which we show here. There are two zones in the airport. There's the airport city. Half of those buildings can be integrated without any kind of removal into the new urbanity of the, of the airport. That zone, which is about runways, um, ramps and access ways, uh, you would have to be into relocation. That's the runway and the taxi areas. But relocation is no great technical feat. I mean, this gem theatre was moved in the same uh, way that Marble Arch was moved in 1851 because it was designed as the entrance to Buckingham Palace and they couldn't get the stage coach through. So they moved it. Wasn't a, wasn't a big deal. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of talk about the SS Montgomery. This is a thermal imaging. The reality is that SS Montgomery is stable. If you don't touch it with construction work, it's probably the ideal environment for half the munitions tonnage that went down in 1944. Um, it can't be too much of a hazard because it is physically next, despite the exclusion zone, it's physically next to one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. So it's not a big deal. Um, then there's the birds. And um, 
we lose 20 kilometers of bird habitat. And what we propose is to create three times that area as an extension, as of the landmass here, as a new nature reserve, which I think will make the birds very happy. There are precedents. There's Wallasey Island, which was created from the, um, all the soil that was excavated to make way for Crossrail. It's a very beautiful area. It's totally new. Didn't exist a few years ago. And it's a result of this process, digging out the earth, putting it somewhere else. If you really want to put an endeavour like this into context, then, um, oh, excuse me, there's the bird strike. Um, bird strikes are, I mean, you move, move most of the birds away, so that reduces the, the, the problem. Um, traditionally, the bird strike zone is a box which is related to these runways about 14 kilometres long, five kilometres wide and nearly a kilometre high. There's an established technology of devices which frighten birds away. And there is a new technology which will probably be enforced by the time this airport would come online, which is embedded in the aircraft and which, um, and which moves the birds aside electronically through, through transmissions. That is... Um, that's in an incubating period uh, at the moment. But the reality is that, uh, that JFK, that Boston, San Diego, airports all over the world have environments which are frequented and shared with birds. And the, the, the statistics are that one fatal accident in over uh, a thousand million, in other words, a billion flying hours, and every airport has a similar uh, problem. And that won't go away. It's a constant around the world. This was the if you like, the last flight into Kai Tak in 1998, Hong Kong's airport, which, uh, like Heathrow, was essentially virtually buried in the urban uh, fabric. And, um, and that airport, which we saw from its very beginning and lived with, um, there's no land for a new airport. So they created it. They chopped down a mountain, literally, and spread it around, got the biggest dredging fleet in the world, bought soil from elsewhere and created an area which is about the same size as Heathrow or major airport. And, um, and quite interestingly, that airport has been consistently voted by something like 11 million, million flying passengers um, eight times uh, out of the last 11 years first place. So the, in, in, in a way, the difficulties which, which challenge some of these ventures have resulted in um, in an optimism have resulted in something which has been very, very widely received by the customers who would use it. Just to, again, this was an, and I remember this move so well, this was an overnight move. Kaitak went overnight uh, to Cheplak Kok. There were 30 sea barges, there were 1,000 vehicles and 16 truck convoys, um, and 29 aircraft just moved overnight beautifully served by a railway uh, network. Um, so the whole infrastructure, wider transportation, moulded into that. We show how park and ride would work using the orbital to be able to drive to the station and the accessibility, all going by rail locally and then connecting with the orbital line uh, to, the, to the airport. Um, I think there are a number of interesting stories here. To get from Manchester to Heathrow by train today um, is typically changing along the way, is typically a three and a quarter hour journey. Um, in its new mode with the orbital, that would be effectively halved, one hour and 50 minutes. If you are going from nearer, uh, from Oxford, then it's a little shorter. This is essentially the same. The point that it's making is because you don't have to change at Paddington um, and you can have a direct route, and then that particular area, as we'll see, we can, through the removal of Heathrow as a hub in the longer term, reinforce that corridor, our equivalent, if you like, to the California Silicon Valley. 60% of the passengers arriving and departing by rail, but which would be integrated into it. So it would be designed simultaneously with it. Again, the holistic thinking. It would become 
uh, literally the busiest station um, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. So here, as we move towards the end, we start to see the way that these elements come together. Um, the uh, hydropower array immediately north of the runways there, the Thames barrier crossing uh, on the left of the, of, the, of the image combined with the hydropower, and the way in which the orbital will run beneath and connect uh, to the transportation uh, directly for convenience. And here we can see the site as it is at the moment, the way in which that morphs, uh, viewed from, uh, from the east um, here, and then taking another viewpoint, looking at it uh, from the west, from the, um, the Thames barrier in the, in the foreground, and, um, and the way in which Heathrow makes that transition possible and becomes the beneficiary in terms of its potential as a new community, combining university, commercial, special economic zones, technology park, entertainment, and incredible green lungs. And in terms of the financing of the project, um, then Heathrow, if you relate it to its known debt, which is 12 billion, assume very conservatively that that is uh, its offset value. The airport, which is always reported as a 50 billion pound um, initiative, is in actual fact, in the scheme of things, only 20 billion of the larger total. Um, so essentially Heathrow would be funding more than 50% of the new airport. Of course, the barrier crossing has its identified costs um, and the orbital rail around London. But each of these are separate components. So, so it's not a kind of Napoleonic one-shot vision. It's feasible um, and in that sense eminently fundable. This is really just summarizing some of those themes, rebalancing the United Kingdom, significantly improving the connections to Europe in such a way that it can start to feed into Europe and has another uh, life stream, and the way in which globally it then connects not just to the established markets but to the emerging markets. In that sense, it becomes a hub and a far more significant hub than all the other airports in Europe which are talked about in that, in that context. I come back to Parliament, to Big Ben, and um, one minute to midnight. I don't think time is on our side. Thank you very much. <laughs>